sun is rising A new day has come Time to smile and open my eyes Time to rise and shine Embrace the blue sky Watch the birds fly Feel the wind blow in my eyes A new day has arrived What a beautiful day What a glorious day Thank you God for all I Thank you for this day Feel the green grass Smell the fresh sea Watch the flowers embrace the sun Love is in the air What a beautiful What a glorious day Thank you God for all I have Thank you for this day Love the day has come to give to God this day. I give to truth, I give to you. What a beautiful day What a glorious day Thank you God for all I
Beautiful. Ah, it's a nice way to ease into the day. <laughs> a sparkly sunny day. Beautiful. Well, I was um, very touched by the movie yesterday and particularly touched by the sharings of those that came forward to uh, pour out their hearts. I mean, really there's nothing more precious than kind of putting your heart on the altar and pouring your heart out with the prayer of healing. There's nothing greater than that. That is the most precious thing there is. I always am just in such a state of gratitude during the whole process because to me I'm tapping into that deep desire for healing and it's, you know, that just brings, it just, my heart just swells when I feel that. And I think we all want to give up compromise and we all want to experience integrity, having the integrity of, of heart and mind, having the integrity deep within us, so we feel completely connected with everyone and everything. And it's striking to me how in this world that we're not really aware of the extent of the compromise, you know, in our words, in our actions, in our thoughts, in our emotions, there's an enormous amount of compromise in the split mind. And I think it comes down to what Jesus said in the, the Bible. He said, no man can serve two masters. And we, we know from studying the Course, we know what he's talking about. You can't really serve love and fear. If, if you try to serve love and fear, you're going to find your mind is like a contradiction. No wonder it seems psychotic and it's split from reality. No wonder it seems schizophrenic and it's listening to multiple voices, not just inside but on the screen <laughs> every day in daily life. No wonder it seems to get depressed. No wonder it, it seems like it's wandering, lost in the dark, wondering, I don't know how I got here but this isn't my home. This split feeling, this divisive feeling, doesn't feel natural. There's something in us that knows that it's not natural and yet we seem to have lost sight of the escape hatch. We seem to be wandering in a vast place where we don't know where the escape hatch is. Or like in the Truman Show, we've lost track of the exit door. <laughs> it's, it's disguised. We can't see it. We can't find it. And so in this world there's all these contradictions, even in the words we speak. 
Sometimes we laugh at the contradictions, like the first time I heard the phrase military intelligence. I just got the f biggest smile on my face and I went, yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Military intelligence. Because we, I laughed because I thought, there is no intelligence in the military. <laughs> That which is based on attack and defense cannot be intelligent. <laughs> That's not intelligent life. <laughs> That's artificial life, <laughs> for sure, there. And then, but actually when we get into the topic of spirituality, we actually uh, don't realize that there are all kinds of contradictions and crazy things. Uh, you know, I remember going to Unity Church, because there's a lot of Unity Churches around the world. There, that's the church where I found I've been hosted the most of any church. But I remember I go into Unity, and, uh, and when I'm with them, we start talking about something, and then they'll say, you know, well, you know, it's like this, and then, but we know it will be different on the other side. And I said, what, what do you mean? What do you mean the other side? And they say, you know, the, you know. I said, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And they said, uh, you know, when we make our transition, I said, transition to, to where or what? And they say, and so, because I started to realize when I'm in Unity Churches, nobody talks about dying. Nobody talks about death or dying. You make your transition, and I'm like, transition to what? And, so, and where? <laughs> and uh, they say, it's, <laughs> it's hard to explain. I said, yeah, I can tell it's hard to explain. And, uh, and finally I say, how many sides are there? This is unity. This is, your name is Unity. <laughs> what do you mean there's sides? And, uh, and there's, uh, whatever, the next life. What does that mean, next life? It reminds me of when Ramana Maharshi was laying down the body, you know, and the, the disciples around Ramana as he was entering his final minutes started, you know, they were crying, and there was all this weeping going on there in India. And he's like, with these sparkly eyes. I mean, the body was emaciated and skinny, and, but the eyes were sparkling. And, and he's like, why are you crying? Where could I go? He, he was like me, he couldn't understand. <laughs> what are these tears for? Where could I go? You know, the, the idea, we've even accepted the idea that there's an afterlife. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Afterlife? There's life and then there's afterlife? And remember what Jesus says in the Course, Be not content with future happiness, for it is not your just reward, for you have cause for freedom now. All we're doing is we're focusing on the now. We have to go fully into the now. That's all it's about. Eckert talks about this. I mean, every talk he gives, he's talking about being present, right? And we know the present moment is the gateway to eternity, so it seems like that's where our focus and attentiveness needs to be, is on the now, not on this hypothetical afterlife or future events. Who cares? You know, actually, Jesus says the past is gone, the future is but imagined. These concerns are but defenses against present change of focus. That's a pretty strong definition. That means the future is a defense mechanism against focus on the present. So much for ambitions, your life goals. <laughs> they have to, you have to see them for what they are. So, uh, you know, in spiritual circles, people are saying, hey, you want to come along? You know, I've got a booth, and maybe you could share your books and come to, and come to a festival. And I say, well, what's, what's the name of the festival? And they say, well, it's a mind-body-spirit festival. I said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I've never heard of such a ridiculous thing. 
Well, you know, we're all about integrating the mind, body, and spirit. But they can't be integrated. They can't. They can't. They say, oh, it's very holistic. Doesn't sound holistic to me. Jesus says, in the Bible, Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you, you perceive the flesh or, there's the key word, or you recognize the spirit. He says in the Course, what do you want? Freedom of the body or freedom of the mind because both you cannot have. You can tell where this is going. He says at one point in the Course, if you are a body, your mind is gone from your self-concept. And if you are a mind, your body is gone from your self-concept. You get where I'm going with this? It's an either-or. And even these mind, body, spirit festivals, well, we know that the body's an illusion because the ego made it up. God did not create the body. God does not create the perishable. God is eternal and God creates e eternally. That's what creation is. That's what spirit is. The body is an invention, a fictitious invention of this puff of nothingness called ego. And then as far as mind, what does Jesus actually have to say about mind? Well, he's got a lot of things to say about it in the Course, but in the clarification of terms, Jesus says, mind is the activating agent of spirit. Oh, is that helpful? That must mean that the only purpose the mind serves is as a conversion factor to recognize what? That you're spirit, that you're pure spirit, that you're eternal. The activating agent of spirit. That's why Jesus can talk about a split mind. He can talk about divine mind. But when he starts talking about divine mind or the mind of God, he's actually speaking of spirit. So what I'm pointing at here is the body and the spirit aren't, reconcil they aren't reconcilable at all. You can't be both. You have to be one or the other. And this is the purpose of A Course in Miracles. It's the Holy Spirit working with your mind, with the mind, to convince it of the reality of spirit. Isn't, doesn't that make intuitive sense to see your I amness, your spirit, your eternal nature is the only purpose of it. And there's stepping stones about using your mind to be in your right mind instead of your wrong mind, to be miracle minded instead of judging and grievances, and then ultimately to let go of the scaffolding, so to speak, and be lifted up into I amness, into spirit, the spirit that I am. Now, this body that the ego made, I said the other day that the body has, in the ego's purposes, it has many, many, many purposes. It can seem to eat, it can seem to sleep, it can seem to draw, it can seem to sing, it can seem to walk, it can seem to talk, it can seem to ski, it can seem to climb, it can seem to have sex, it can seem to do millions of different purposes. And none of them are true. None of them. Why? Because the body's not true. How can that which doesn't even exist have a bunch of multiple purposes? That's like saying, oh, I got some nothingness going here, and can I spice up this uh, nothingness? Uh, yeah, I'll just give it a bunch of different purposes. And then you're in the contradiction of trying to pick between those purposes. You project time onto the body and you call it aging. You project time, the concept of linear time, onto the body and you call it aging. And then when the body starts to look a certain way and the hair starts turning white and the wrinkles start coming in, you start to get out your iPhone to make your bucket list. You want to get your final things in before you die. You're going to do this bucket list. 
you know. What does, this is a joke. This is a joke. The human experience as it's being experienced is, is nothing but specialness. Why is it specialness? Because God didn't create it. The ego made it up. Specialness is another, it's a synonym for ego. Now, this specialness must be pretty sneaky because why would Jesus spend nine chapters from chapter 15 to chapter 24 talking about specialness? That's a lot of, that's a lot of chapters in the middle of the book to devote to something. I remember when I used to go to Roscoe, New York to be with Ken and Gloria and everything, I met my friend Dorothy up there, and Dorothy worked in the kitchen. And she, we would sit in her apartment and talk and everything, and she said, it's crazy up here. I said, oh, tell me about it. You know, Roscoe, New York, up in the Catskills, what's crazy? What's crazy about what's going on here at the Foundation for A Course in Miracles? She said, well, one thing, anytime Ken does a talk on specialness, like a workshop, we have to buy like five times as much food because people start stuffing their faces when Ken starts talking about specialness. When Ken does a workshop in specialness, we got to go out, we got to buy all this extra food. And then she, I'd say, what else? And she'd say, well, they're all studying this Course in Miracles, but they come and and they, they listen to Ken's workshops and they listen and then as soon as the workshop's over they go off gossiping, judging, fighting, arguing. She said it's like a revolving door. They're in the workshop, they're taking notes. Yeah, yeah. Good point, Ken. That's a good, good point. Jesus says, Jesus, you're right. That's a good point. And then Dorothy would prepare the food so she'd make like a, a big buffet of food and they would tell her, you know, make regular food like, and make, make a, a vegetarian dish because there's people that are coming, they'll complain, forget it that, that they're working the course, they're still going to complain if you don't have a vegetarian dish, so she'd make that. And then she'd just make the food, she'd put it all out, she'd step back and she'd smile and the people would go and put a little food on and then they'd say, this food is not warm enough and this should be colder. This is too salty. This needs more spice and salt. And she would just sit there <laughs> like, like, this is a course in miracles for God's sake. Practice the teachings. There's no revolving door between the workshop and the kitchen. <laughs> Do not, it was like everybody's very reverent and taking notes, but then as soon as they go through the, into the cafeteria, it's back to being human. <laughs> yeah! We can only stand an hour and a half of that lecture stuff and then, yeah, let's get back to judging. Uh, you know, it's, it's crazy. That's not going to bring you the kingdom of heaven doing the revolving door thing. So, I think it's important to realize that the ego has many purposes for the body and, and none of them are true. That's good to remember. Second thing is, the Holy Spirit has one function for the body and that's the communication device. It's, that's, it's better to start thinking of your body like your cell phone. Yeah. Really. It's like, uh, don't treat your body any differently than you would a cell phone. You don't go to your cell phone at night. Are you warm enough there? <laughs> you, need, you need some covers? I'm going to tuck you in. <laughs> are you hungry? <laughs> you are? Okay, I'll plug you in right now. <laughs> you want to be at 100%? Okay, all night. And, and you don't... I mean, you get, may get a case for it to protect it, but some of these cases, have you seen some of these iPhone cases? Really, diamonds and dress it up, you know. Some people have different wardrobes for their cell phone. Like, what, what do you want to wear today? You know. This is, 
If you could see that you're doing the same thing with the body that you're doing with the cell phone, it, and that you go to extreme efforts to use your mind for all the many purposes that the ego made up, made up for the body. And, uh, well, I'll get to the communication thing every once in a while. Call your mother. N no, really. You know, it's not a happy day if I do that. You know, the Spirit's always prompting us to, to let this be used to laugh, to share, to smile, to shine. Its only use is for a communication device. It's, it's not hard to remember. One purpose. Jesus is like, please remember this. It's just one. <laughs> Not millions, just one. Just please focus on this. Because guess what? As you start to merge with this one function for the body, and you start to feel this unified awareness, when you give it over so much to the Holy Spirit, pretty soon you will learn to forget the body entirely. Yes, it will disappear from your awareness. Why? Because... Nothing in this world has existence in and of itself. Not a cell phone, not a cup, not a glass, not a shoe, not an apple, not a tree, not a mountain. Why would we think that this world of many, many parts are real when God is whole, God is one? Why would oneness create parts? Why would oneness need time? Why would eternity need time? It doesn't. The parts are part of the misperception. So basically, I was digging through the Course and I found many, many references. The sole responsibility of the teacher of God is to accept the atonement. Yes, I saw that one twice. And I saw many passages where it said this, the one use that the Holy Spirit has for the body is for a communication device. And then one day, I was going through the Course and I came upon a sentence and I went, oh my God. God, it's in here. I couldn't believe I found it. I found this one reference where Jesus said, the body has no purpose. And I was like, oh, wow. But you can imagine, if your mind becomes so unified, like the quantum field, everything's energy, everything's perfectly connected, that in the end, guess what disappears? Your awareness of things. You won't be thinking about things and situations. You won't be thinking in separation. You won't be thinking in fragmented mind. You'll be thinking in unified, unified mind. And you are ready for God to take that last step because when everything becomes unified, when you start to see this is all energy and it's all in mind, then you, get, you are so close to heaven that God will lift you back to pure spirit to pure love, to pure light, to the kingdom of heaven. But the responsibility that we're talking about here is to give it over. What we want to talk about today is we want to talk about the, the seeming process of going from the mundane, egoic perception to forgiveness or unified perception. That's why you're here. You want to really hear it. Because... I was very touched. Lisbeth, when, when Lisbeth, you came down in the front yesterday and I could see your face and I, I remembered meeting you over here in Holland. I remembered you coming all the way across uh, for a month there in Utah and it, you may have had some frustrations and some fears and doubts, but it's like when you came to Utah toward the end of that uh, mystery school. You had rage coming up. You had anger. And to me, I saw that as a huge advance. If we're sitting on pockets of rage and we're not allowing that to come up into the light to heal, we're just going through the motions while we're sitting on the rage. You know, we can't have anger and rage and think we're the Christ. <laughs> Uh, because those don't go together. An angry Christ doesn't go together. Even people always tell me, well, he turned over the tables in the temple. I said, I could knock tables over and be in as happy as a lark. Knocking tables over is nothing. 
especially if there's birds there and there's animals and the symbol was they were buying and they were buying and selling animals to burn as sacrifices to God and he'd knock the tables over I do the same thing I'm not angry I'm just happy <laughs> this is foolish you <laughs> this is ridiculous burning animals to please God so it's uh, Jesus didn't get angry that's the thing you know when, even when people look at certain passages of the Bible and they say well he got really angry in the temple oh yeah well that would contradict all of his teachings about turn the other cheek and love your neighbor as yourself you know how is that getting angry loving your neighbor as yourself I can't quite figure that out that's another contradiction so when Lisbeth was down here and she was pouring her heart out and I could tell uh, Lisbeth, you were on the verge of starting to see that these, there are certain concepts and roles in your mind that you still believe in and you are aware that they're producing guilt. But underneath that, there's a prayer, like, it's help me escape from this. How many here have had, had guilt around a parent? How many here have had guilt around, around children? How many here have had any guilt around your relatives and your biological family? How many here have had any guilt around food? <laughs> Has anybody here had any guilt around sex? <laughs> Everyone's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this is good. This is good. I'm glad because then we can talk openly like, well, there must be... What's the source of the guilt? If it can't be really about the food. It can't really be about mom and dad and brothers and sisters and children. It, that must be some kind of diversionary projection going on there because it can't really be the source of guilt is these little characters that are moving around on the screen or these little pieces of bananas and meat and whatever you want to call it or these bodies doing all kinds of things with their fluids Oh my God, I've got fluids, inappropriate fluids coming in here and inappropriate fluids going out there and I hope they don't see my nose is running. Uh, you know, that's inappropriate. You're not supposed to have fluid coming out in public from a nose. In fact, I can't think of many fluids that can come out appropriately in public. That's all for your private mind and your private thoughts, yeah. You, get, you make sure you do that behind closed doors. But you don't go out there and let any fluids out in public. If somebody, if a comedian takes a drink and they spit it out, that might be funny. But if they do it in a restaurant, uh, that's not appropriate. <laughs> so we have to start to realize that the source of guilt is specialness. Specialness is another name for the ego. And Jesus is telling us that you don't want to have an investment in anything of the world. Even your spouse, even your mother and father, even your child, if you put them above all else, then in this world you're still missing the point that everything is equally the same here and the focus needs to go to God. You have to put God above all else. Of course above parents, of course above spouses, of course about your bucket list. Put God, put God at the top of your bucket list. If you, if you thought you were going to die, I'd definitely put G-O-D on the bucket list and to hell with the rest of the, the things. I can do without those. I want eternal life, not to go climbing Mount Everest or, you know, eating squid or whatever. You know, it's just, it's bizarre. So actually, actually, you have to realize that, that when Jesus said, who is my father, mother, sister, brother? He that does the will of our Father in heaven is father, mother, sister, brother. He meant it literally. And when people say, I would love to go home to God, but I've got all these responsibilities for all these dream figures, this one, 
and I've got that one over there and that one there, and I'm feeling all heavy and weighed down. I'm sad, I'm depressed, I'm guilty. Oh, come on. Let's look at where is that sadness and depression coming from? Even duties and obligations. You know, when Jesus and the Bible said, honor thy father, honor thy mother, how could you really honor them except through forgiveness? If you try to honor them in any way except by forgiving them, and I mean seeing the false as false, you will have an idol. You will make a graven image, a graven image before the Lord thy God. You have to really, I mean really put God first. Really. That's what Jesus is saying. Because anything that you value that's temporary is a block to eternity. Does that make sense? If God created the eternal and you're putting value in the temporary, then it's basically saying to God, hold off there. You know, I'm not quite ready to say yes to you and be one with you. I'd rather tinker around with these fake images a little bit longer. Okay, well, spirit is not on a search and destroy mission. If that's what your wish, it's a death wish, no doubt. But if you want to play around with the images a little bit longer... Well, you're, you can do that. You won't be happy, but you know you're, you can attempt that. But there's still a, a huge level of denial going on there because you've been called by God to wake up and you prefer to sleep. I like that movie that Jennifer Lawrence did called Passengers. Did anybody see that one where they, they're on this long mission in space and they're all kind of in these like pods and they're sleeping because they've got to go so far that they have to sleep and then there's malfunctions and this one guy was it Chris Pratt or plays it and everything he wakes up and he's walking along all these pods and he happens to look in one of the pods and it, it's Jennifer Lawrence she's cute and this is a long lonely trip in space I think I can maybe find a way to wake up Jennifer Lawrence if I'm going to be out here for weeks and months and years with nothing. It's Jennifer Lawrence, you know. So he, he wakes her up. She is pissed. She is pissed. She has an expectation she's going to be sleeping all the way. And she is pissed because she's been woken up ahead of schedule. But to me, when I watched that movie, I was just in the theater bursting laughing. I thought, now there's a sleep addiction. <laughs> You'd rather sleep than be woken up by a passenger, a man. <laughs> she, at one point, one scene, she just hitting on him, beating him, trying to beat the hell out of him. She's got all of her rage coming up. And to me, I'm just in the theater laughing, going... That's a strong attraction to sleep, <laughs> to generate that kind of rage. <laughs> but this is what we're talking about with the human condition. There's a sleep addiction going on here. There's a, there's a draw, there's an attraction to the subconscious mind, to the darkness. Now, what we do is we say, okay, we want to move in the right direction, and that direction would be to start to take the focus off of the body and how can my thoughts, my mind energy, my focus, how can I pour my heart, my emotions into something that will bless the whole. That's what made Jesus different seemingly from the sleeping humans is he wanted to know what is God's will for me. He wanted to know what serves the whole. And when Jesus was speaking, you know those red letters in the Bible? And when Jesus is speaking in the Course, that's for the whole cosmos. That's not for this planet. Those words are, guess what? For the aliens. Those words are for those that live on also on other planets. Because when you follow those words and go into that unifying forgiveness experience, you're forgiving all the creatures on all the realms. You're forg forgiving aliens and alien abductions and <laughs> you're, you're, you're forgiving the whole time-space cosmos when you accept the atonement. Because 
there's no life out of heaven, so basically you're forgiving time and space and everything that is part of time and space. Now this is important, so how do you do that? How do you to go from this day-to-day -day perception into that? Well that's what Francis and I were talking about this morning because whether it's projects, whether it's relationships, whatever you're going to allow yourself to be used for is going to be a blessing for the whole. It's not going to be serving some tiny self-concept. It's not going to be personal. Because what Jesus calls us to do is for the whole universe. So when we're smiling, when we're smiling for the whole universe, when we're laughing, we're laughing for the entire universe. There's only one of us. And, and what I tell people is, if you're happy, the whole universe is happy because there is no universe apart from your mind. And when you're depressed, the whole universe is depressed. And in terms of prayer, whatever you want, you want for the whole universe because there's only one of us. So if you want a Snickers bar, the whole universe wants a Snickers bar because there's only you, there's only your mind. And when you put God first above all else, you've done that for the whole universe. You've just done the most glorious thing you could ever do by putting God as number one. In fact, that's the Creator. Why wouldn't I want to put the Creator number one? You know, it, it, in the Star Trek Next Generation, there's Captain Picard. It's coming back, you know. The, Picard is there's going to be another series. He's coming back. Seven of Nine's coming back. We're going to have more Star Trek. But anyway, he would always say something, you know, very definitely, we're, we're going to do this. Make it so, number one. And number one was Riker, was the guy who's going to put it into action. Well, if the Holy Spirit is like the captain of your mind, wouldn't it be fun if you could be number one, meaning, I will do whatever you command, Holy Spirit. You say it. And if you say, make it so, and I don't even hesitate, I, I don't rebel, I don't talk back, I don't try to argue it out. You don't say to the Holy Spirit, I don't like that instruction. I don't like it. Or, no, I'm not going to do it. No. No. Helen tried that. Helen tried that with Jesus, where she would like purposefully not pick her pen up and she'd be like, go sometimes for days. Uh, uh, days. And then finally she'd go, oh, right. <laughs> and she'd start writing. And then she'd, she'd wait for her thank you. And, and Jesus is like, thank you. And then he'd give a little instruction. He'd say, a good scribe must be under Christ's control. And that's the way the Holy Spirit is. It's, it's gentle, in other words, patient, no coercion. You're not forced to do anything at all. But when you have the willingness to say yes, yes, Holy Spirit, I will follow you, the Holy Spirit's like, thank you. Very softly like that too. Thank you. Thank you. Because what the Holy Spirit is offering for you is for the whole universe and it's for your happiness. If you want to be happy, you follow that voice. That's the bridge back to heaven. Why would you not follow the bridge back to heaven? In fact, that's the only bridge back to heaven. It goes by different names in different cultures. But this, there's, this is the pipeline. So what we wanted to talk about is, is like Francis can share, coming, even coming to the community, it's not really about the community per se. We talk about the prayer, we talk about collaborations, because that takes you out of this personal orientation into the higher realms. And we talk about giving over all your skills and abilities, not to make a body identity, not to reinforce a body identity, 
not for any purposes of the ego, but simply to come back into total alignment with spirit so that you can awaken to spirit. When you think about, even with the movie last night, Rocket Man, and I was talking about the drinking the, the chalice of the poison chalice, and I was saying he took a big gulp out of it, but that poison chalice all requires a body identification. Remember I mentioned like fame and fortune? You can seem to have a famous body or a body that has a big fortune, but not the spirit. There's no such thing as a famous spirit. If there's only one spirit, famous to what? To who? <laughs> I'm really famous. Yeah? To who? Jesus is like, to who? Oh, I'm really rich. I, I am a rich spirit. I am not a poor spirit. I am an abundant spirit, not a poverty-stricken spirit. You know, see how funny that sounds? Because we usually don't put those two words together, poverty spirit. <laughs> People do it with consciousness. They try to convince me that there's an abundant consciousness and a poverty consciousness. And I'm like, wait a minute. The ego is, the, the consciousness is the domain of the ego. So you're saying there's an abundant kind of ego and a poverty kind of ego? I thought ego was ego. It's like an abundant death wish or a poor death wish. That's ridiculous. So I don't buy into poverty consciousness and abundance consciousness and trying to do things with an illusory figure to try to get yourself more into one column over the other. Consciousness is something that's to be transcended. Consciousness is to be forgiven. So you can rise up to unified awareness and then be taken into perfect pure spirit. So I know that a lot of you are, are really interested about the topic this morning. That's the context for the topic. And that's why Francis can share with us that as we talk about projects, it's not really about the project, but, but that's the backdrop. And when we talk about relationship, it's not really about the bodies or the persons, but that's the backdrop. You know, you don't want to skip over the backdrop. It's like the story of, um, the story of two Course in Miracles students that start arguing arguing about an interpretation of a passage in the Course in Miracles. And, in, and it gets more frustrating and more frustrating and the anger level just goes higher and higher and higher until one student says, listen, I'm not here and you're not here and we're not having this conversation. And the other student goes, ah, get out of here. Because what? Jesus says you can't deny the body. That's the inappropriate use of denial. That's a clean example of I'm not here, you're not here, and we're not having this conversation. Oh yeah? Okay. Is there any anger happening? <laughs> it coming up? Well, maybe we should focus on what's going on in the mind and, and open to the help from the Holy, Holy Spirit instead of trying to deny that there's something even happening. That's an example of, like the, they call it in Advaita Vedanta, the Advaita shuffle. When you try to just gloss over appearances as if the appearances aren't there. You know, using verbiage, using words, but if there's emotions going on underneath there, you've got to address those emotions. You can't just wash it away. And so we do that with, with projects. We do that with relationships. If somebody comes say and say, you know, I just, I'm having a hard time, I was doing this, and then I got this look from this person, you know, we don't all go, oh, no, that didn't happen. Oh, that, did, that, that look didn't happen. Oh, they perceived the look, and they had emotions, and then we say, how, does, how do you feel? I'm upset. Okay, you're upset, and, and what else? Well, I don't like I don't like the way they do this and this and this. You know, then you start to see the projections. You actually have an allowance for healing to occur, but you don't do it by denying 
what is in form. You actually have to look at the interpretation in the mind, which is a faulty interpretation that you need to give over to the Holy Spirit. So that's the key to this whole thing for us. Yeah, I just also want to point out what David was saying. It was so important. If we put, <clears throat> if we put God above all else, it's not so much about what we do. It's really about what we do it for. So in a way, our lives probably don't look so different than yours or than anybody's. We all share a lot of logistics in our lives and a lot of decisions and a lot of relationships. But it's really what are we doing it for. And I also just want to mention one thing um, on the first afternoon's clip with this uh, Rwanda woman, Immaculate, she actually, um, you know, there there was a point where all of these um, opposite tribe came to the house to search, and they were calling her name, they were going to come in, and she, there was a point she actually prayed. She said, you know, if I die right now, I don't know you to God. I don't know whether you really exist or not. So give me a chance to know you. I can die tomorrow. Let them find me tomorrow. But now I need to know you first. So it's almost like she was saying, I need to know you before death, before living. That's the first thing that's on my mind. It was so clear in her mind. Then this you know, then we saw what what was going on in the movie. The 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 killer actually tried to open the the door, and then stopped. And that's where she started to say, "Okay." You know, when the priest in the end opened the the door, she was like, "Can I have a Bible?" You know, okay, something is happening here. But that is what she decided. And now she seemed to be able to share, but it's really, she lives now because of a higher purpose. And, and she, the fact that she's in our mind now is to remind us this is the purpose of our, our living. This is really the, the purpose of living. Look at how happy she is. She never cried talking about the death of the people and for friends and family because she found something so huge from that experience. So so I just think, you know, the, the thing is, she had that moment that was so clear in her mind, but how to keep that focus in our everyday life is, is really the question. You know, we have this desire and, and yet it just get distracted and lost. So really, what I want to just probably start, and then we might even invite other um, people from the community to come share their experience. So I just want to point a few things out just to show how to keep the focus so clear so that we don't get so distracted in the familiar doings throughout the day. So when David um, started, I think, um, the journey with the course, I hear the the examples a lot, and I I see that even today, that he started by traveling and really just following Jesus. You know, he did the traveling to know Jesus. And then... um, when after that phase of traveling, I believe, then Jesus actually said, um, build a website. Build a website and put your um, sharings on the website and on YouTube. And at that time, he didn't even know what YouTube was. It was a new thing. So, so y- David didn't know how to build a website and then it was just always, okay, tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Buy a domain with GoDaddy. That's the first step. Then go back to H- HTML code. Do the type in this code, type in that code. And I think 
just because、um, this was the 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 life and the experience that started, and it was so clear in your mind that with Jesus you can do everything, and there is really no need to to rely or be dependent on anything but the the guidance. So then, gradually, I think when the community started to form around David, people join in. The people that we were linking is really just to continue that channel. So relationships are formed so that Jesus or Spirit can speak to us. So we can pray and hold the same prayer, so Spirit can speak to us. So. The way that it started to 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 look like is that we all just started to say, okay, then we seem to have this skill, we or we don't seem to have this skill, but let's pray together and see what is our project, what is our day look like, and then you know, of course, there. There are a lot of thoughts at the beginning. There might be, I feel this. I feel I don't feel this. I don't agree with you, but that is, that's all very natural. That's all very accepted because the whole point is that we're gonna forgive all the thoughts that are distracting our clear hearing. So we lay the thoughts out. So we. We have expression sessions just for that purpose, and after expression session, our minds are clean and cleared. Let's hear the guidance and move on. That's really what it is. And why do we do project? Why is that important? After we hear the instruction to do this and actually do it, because there is still so much doubt. And there is so so much belief. You know, I am the doer, and I need to rely on myself. There is so much washing to do in the mind, and all this listen and follow is nothing but an opportunity to witness that you are not the doer. The spirit will tell you what to do, and if you accept that fullheartedly, let your body be used that way. It will come through and be done through by Jesus, and that's why we don't get so caught up by I don't know how to do this, I don't know how to build a website, because from the beginning that w- there was a strong witness with Spirit, we can do everything. So that becomes the foundation of、um, of how we do things and and our everyday life. Which is a huge amount of trust that spirit does guide us, guide us every single day, and we can trust and we can carry forward. We can carry forward. So that is really the foundation of our daily life, and of course, all the all the.、Um, The relationships are all brought in by by Jesus as well. This is so unbelievable. The people that are, you know, like family, they're like family because we know each other so intimately. <laughs> because not because we have dependence on each other or have pre- preference that I like this type of person. No, it only because we have allowed ourselves to be so transparent. With each other, so in the end, we realize we're the same. We're all the same, and there is a, a deep intimacy and deep trust, and a, a,、um, a joined, a joined trust that okay, if we are in the same team together, the spirit gonna come through us and carry forward this project to to serve the whole, not the project. Necessarily will will serve the whole, but the fact that we can keep our mind clear and hear the spirit and witness the spirit, that is so uplifting for our mind. That serves the whole. That's truly what is the the gift. That's truly what's the fruit. So, you know, over many years, you might see we have I don't know a hundred websites. And, and、um, 
it doesn't make any sense to the normal way of doing things. And all of them are built within the community by community members as a backdrop for this listening and following and for forgiving any dynamics and thoughts that come up among the team members. So whenever we form a team, we feel, okay, these are the, the configuration, then solely this, this group is going to be used and move forward from this point until the end of the project for this, for this purpose. We accept each other fully because we use that relationship and we use that function for this purpose. So this purpose is, is very, very important. So we have a lot of websites that, that looks like the fruit, but it's really the, you know, if you ask the people who are behind those websites, they've been doing it for years. They never had any web building skills. They, they listen and follow every day, and they're the, the first-hand winners that they're guided by Jesus. And they have this internal source of inspiration day in and day out just by doing their function. They're so happy and that is their reward. There is no other reward. They don't need any other reward. They never come out to, to say, hey, I'm who and who. There is no recognition, no credit, nothing, but their reward is what they're doing this for. And and then over the years, David, at first you said that you were just traveling and then someone in Australia said you need to have a product because you need to, even for, for visas and stuff, you need to have a product. That's where you started to, okay, let's put all the recording together and transcribe into books. And then someone in the community felt inspired to do that kind of things, things. So that's why books come out, one after the next, the next. But that is also coming out for their own healing. So we have this, you know, seeming teams, at one point of publi publication team, distribution team, design. And they all just come when the time was right. And they came for the same purpose. Same purpose. I want to heal my mind. I want to know Jesus is directing me, and I want to do it with a group of people who can remind me and who can help me clear my mind. Because if I'm living on my own, I don't know how to um, forgive those thoughts because they're just looping in my mind. So when we come together, then the thoughts got projected. Then we can clear it, continue to clear this. Then suddenly... It's, it becomes very simple and very easy. And then, you know, for Emily, who used to be a very trained and skilled opera singer, she was training Italy. She, she sang opera, and then she came to the community, and the spirit said, I'm going to use your to organize mystery schools and organize this big event and to start a center in Spain. And it has nothing to do with singing, seemingly. And she was like, okay then, use me, use me, use me this way. And there are many, many examples like that. I can just say every single one in the community came with this, with this willingness, and that is the most important requirement, really, that this is the sole purpose, this is the, the only thing that is required. Then every day, things would just seem to happen through prayer, but, you know, the, the only thing that is hold, that's held in everybody's mind is, I'm willing, I'm willing to let go of my own will, I'm willing to listen to you, because you first. And you may see, you know, some people actually have their skill set fully used. They come here, they, they used to be, a, a, you know, a very skilled technician or web builder, and they, they got used as well. So it's not like skills or any ability is, is discounted. It's not like that. It's, it's just 
the purpose coming here is to have a blank slate, and we pray if it is not a blank slate, that's that's fine. Let's raise it up and let's share and let's forgive, so that we can come back to that place. So that is really how this was started and held very very strong till today. That's how all the projects seem to unfold, and what seem to happen because in the experience, in my own experience behind those projects, all that I can say is all that we do was to pray, hear, express, 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 then then land it on the prayer, then move forward with it. So that's really the, the, the thing that is consistent. And the, the form seems to vary every day. And you can see how, how strikingly different that is from the way the world operates. For example, a couple of years ago, I was, I was having lunch with Judy Scutch, who's the publisher of the course. She's in her, at that point, mid-80s. We're, we're having lunch. And uh, she said, you know, we've just been, we just pray together. We have board meetings, and we all pray together. We have organization meetings, we just pray together. It was so cool. It's like here, in the modern days, it sounded like more like, the Essenes or Mother Teresa or the Franciscans and here's Judy, the publisher of the course saying, well that's, what, that's how we make all of our decisions, we pray for all of our decisions. In fact, it was kind of strikingly obvious to her how different that was from the world because there's another book some of you might know of called the Urantia book and uh, it's, a, it's bigger than the course, it's a book about the Urantia is earth, so it's got the whole history of everything and what, was, what scriptures were burned and where and a huge perspective. The last section actually Francis is going through now, the, the life and teachings of Jesus. It's the fourth section. Anyway, the Urantia book is, is quite, it's a little more linear, obviously, than the course is much more direct and vertical, but it's still got some very, very helpful passages and amazing parables of Jesus in depth, in depth sermons by Jesus back 2,000 years ago and so forth. Someone from the Urantia Foundation came to Judy Scutch and said, I, Can I meet with you? And she said, Sure. So this person came in, they met with her, and they said, We want to learn from you. The course has been published and disseminated all over the planet, it's been translated into all these different languages. It's just, it's cut like wildfire. And so she said, yeah, it's, it's amazing. That's the Spirit's plan. It's just, just happening. And they said, well, we want to know. If you, would, if you please would share it with us, we would be so grateful if you would share your business plan with us. Because we have the Urantia book, and we would love for our book to spread around the world like A Course in Miracles has. And she said, uh, we don't have one. And he said, what do you mean? You're like a big organization that's existed for decades and you don't have a business plan? She said, no, we don't have a business plan. We have no business plan. He said, that's hard to believe. Well, how do you function if you don't have a business plan? We pray. Well, I mean, but, but what's your, how do you move in there? We pray. We, whenever we have something that has to be decided, and we just come together and we pray. Like the original four, Ken, Helen, Bill, Ju Judy, they actually had all these big black binders of typed Course in Miracles, like seven giant big black binders. That's how the course was in the form when they kind of all came together and it reached that point when Judy came on the scene. They have these stack of black binders, uh, not really a, a very helpful as far as dis distribution. Uh, they probably weighed like 50 pounds because uh, they're big binders. And so they basically all sat together and they prayed 
And then of the four, it was Judy who actually heard in her mind, because they never, when they pray, they never know who would be the one that would hear. It wasn't always Helen. It was actually Judy who heard, because they were praying, what do we do next? What's our next step? We got these seven giant black binders. What do we do next? They were praying, praying with that question to Jesus. And Jesus did not give an answer. He said through Judy in her mind, make the commitment first. They all were like, Make the commitment, make a, make a lifelong commitment, almost like to steward this course. This is Jesus Christ bringing this amazing scripture, which I have heard some people say, it's like a, in, in Israel they were like all buzzing back in the 70s. There's a new Bible. They've discovered a new Bible. Where? Is it, is it out where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls? No, it's, it's in New York City. What? What the hell? <laughs> in Hebrew, I don't know the language, but oy vey. <laughs> A new Bible in, in New York City. Can't be so. But anyway, they, they all prayed. She heard, make the commitment first. And before they could even receive the instructions, which would come next for the publishing, where they would get the money, and the publishing of the first volume of A Course in Miracles, they had to make a lifelong commitment to it. And I have to say that of the four, all four, Judy's the only one that's, Judy's still standing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she's in a wheelchair. But, <laughs> in my mind, <laughs> Judy's still standing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, she's 88, and but she's... She's still praying, and the very thing that Francis is talking about is, is strikingly different. Strikingly different from the way that things operate in the world. Because when people come, and we're working to collaborate together, they're coming for one reason, to listen and follow, to learn to tune in to Jesus and listen and follow. That's the priority. Contrast the previous lives, like in a previous life, you, you worked in business and you were a business owner. You owned your own business in Australia, financial planning. And they come from, from being business owners or having all kinds of skills and craftsman skills and abilities and so forth. And then they come with one purpose, to listen and follow. And then the one who is directing the plan, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, uses the skills and abilities. And Francis very eloquently showed that sometimes, you know, it just these different configurations. The, the publishing team we had for some years that were publishing all these books, they weren't professional publishers, professional editors, professional anything. JP, you know, he, he started off, I remember I was in the, in the main house of the monastery and I was, we had just finished some retreats, I was getting ready to leave and I think Lisa, Suzanne and others, we were all leaving and they, they looked around, there was only a handful of them and JP was one of them, he, he was maybe what, in his 24 years old, from, from Hawaii, come from Hawaii, living in a, a yoga a retreat center and they looked around and they went, oh my gosh, does anybody here have any computer skills? Not a word. Because in JP's mind, well, he, he knows how to work a computer, but he's not trained. So he didn't raise his hand, he didn't even say anything. They were kind of concerned, like, uh-oh, we're out here at the monastery and there's, nobody knows computer skills and of the whole group of us. Like, but now, Years later, he, he helps oversee a, an internet ministry with no webmastering skills, no IT skills at all, and he's doing it intuitively, and he's been doing it intuitively. So it's better to say that Jesus is doing it through JP. And Jesus did it through the publishing company until the point came when those people left, and then a professional publisher called and, and said, 
Yeah. You know, I'd like to collaborate, and then it took a different direction. But that's all under Jesus' control as well. Yeah, and I think it is also because it was truly no investment to any result except to follow Jesus. Because at one point, the publishing team were were doing a lot of books and e-books, and we have a store. And then all of a sudden, some of them left, and then the only one left uh, stayed, said she honestly did not feel any inspiration anymore. David said, okay, no more publication from this point anymore. And everybody was like, no more publication, no more books ever, that's it? David said, yeah, that's it. What, like it's, there is no sign and symbol because what is guided is provided. So if it is not provided, really there is no investment to have anything else. And then I think it actually probably in the same month or later, then this person who said I have no inspiration anymore got a, um, contacted by a publisher saying they want to publish David's book. So then it started to just reveal itself. But it was so, yeah, just so clear that any of these things that is going on was purely serving, you know, they're, they're all temporary sim- symbols. There is no longevity necessarily for symbols unless they're guided by the Spirit. And I feel like David is such an example because at the beginning, when I started to travel with David, I, I asked him, I said, how do you address bathroom needs when, when you're on stage um, if the gathering goes for too long? And he just said, spirit orchestrated it all. And I'm like, okay, so there's absolutely no thought put into anything. All this trust is just given to the spirit from bigger things, smaller things, bodily needs. It was, that was, you know, the beginning. I'm like watching every single, every single demonstration. And it, it was truly demonstrating where the mind is focused on and what, where is it at. Yeah, it's like it's the whole purpose of listen, follow is just to, to get down to the unconscious mind and, and have all the beliefs dissolved in the light so there's no more dark beliefs. I remember the movie The Matrix came out and they were doing like a simulation with Neo and Morpheus and then at the end of the simulation uh, thing where they were kind of battling it out, uh, at one point, uh, Morpheus said to Neo, do you really believe that's air that you're breathing? I mean, how's that for questioning assumptions? Because Neo had forgotten, it was, he was in a simulation, you know, that the matrix is all just a simulation. And he said, Morpheus said, do you really believe that's air that, that you're breathing? That's an assumption. You know, that's, that's getting off the screen from, from being a dream figure to the dreamer of the dream. The dreamer could have some fun. Do you really believe that's air that you're breathing? From a dreaming position. Imagine telling yourself in the middle of a lucid dream where you're aware that you're dreaming and all of a sudden your character starts to drown and goes underwater and they're gasping for air. And then the dreamer going, do you really believe you have to breathe? <laughs> You see how, how deep it goes. Because the dreamer doesn't need to breathe. It's just the body. The body seems to need air. It's false cause and effect. But that's, that's how deep it goes. So the contrast too between listen and follow. Everyone's brought together by Jesus. It's all part of a plan of awakening, of clearing the unconscious mind. Let's contact, contrast that again with some of you have, have dealt with business, right? You've, you've worked in companies. Has anybody worked in a company? Okay, that's good. Does, does that company have an HR department, a human resources department? Okay, why do you have a human resources department except somebody, a team usually, has to manage what? The skills and abilities of the employees to serve the product that's being produced so it can be sold, so the company can make a profit and pay the employees. You know, you know the whole business model. Well, we don't have an HR department. We have an HS department. <laughs> it's 
called Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit does everything that HR would do, except the Holy Spirit doesn't get a salary. Isn't that cool? H HR department, you've got to pay everybody. Has to have salary, retirement, perks, how much, two weeks vacation, three weeks vacation. Isn't it great? We've got HS, no salary, no days off, no vacation required, great instructions, clear, beautiful instructions. Look at the manuals. We've got A Course in Miracles. Produces great manuals, products. Loving, gentle, kind, never a harsh word, never commands, never demands. Wow, that's, that's not human. You're darn right it's not human. <laughs> that is not human at all. But it's more than just an HS department. When you start to look at it, everyone who comes into the ministry is coming to forgive, coming to accept the atonement, t coming to listen and follow. So when we talk about coming in and helping out to serve in the plan, it's more about heart-to-heart -heart talks about where are, where are your attachments? Where do you still feel attached to the world? Where do you still feel obligations, duties? Where do you still feel you could free yourself up for the Holy Spirit to be used in higher and higher capacities for the whole? We're not having typical intake interviews like they do at businesses in the world, you know. Let's see your resume. Okay. How much are you want? How much are you asking? Uh, here's how much the company can pay. Salary, hours, uh, vacation, uh, perks, you know. This is how it works when you go in to do an interview for a corporation. It's a lot of, it's a bargain, it's a contract, but it involves a lot of things like that that are what? Really all about survival of the body. And I have to tell you, the ones that come in that are so devotional, that are coming in to go for spiritual awakening, they all have a, a, a strong case of Mother Teresa-itis. Uh, they are devoted to Jesus. They're not coming in here, okay, what's my salary going to be? How many days off? How long my vacation? We don't even talk about those things. Because what? They trust like Mother Teresa, like St. Francis, that they will be provided for. If you're doing this work for the whole universe, what did Jesus say in the Bible? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and what? All, all things else will be added unto you. That all your needs will be met. Of course, in A Course in Miracles, he's very eloquent, you know. Once you've accepted his plan as the one function that you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you without your effort. Oh my God! He'll go before you, making straight your path and leaving in your way no stones to trip on, no obstacles to bar your way. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. You need take thought of nothing except the only purpose you would fulfill. Now that's a promise. That's in the Course. That's, talk about lilies of the field. Jesus is like, in case you missed it, my lilies of the field talk 2,000 years ago. Let me give it to you straight. The thing is for me, I just said, okay then, I trust this. If I need bathroom breaks, if I need food, if I need transportation, if I need collaborators, if I need to build a website, if I need to, to dig a hole or work on a, a septic pump or do something electrically or whatever, either you will show me, Jesus, what to do, which has happened many times with the web. I was like, what? What next? I mean, I'm like, I didn't have any web training at all, so I was just like, whoa, listen and follow. This is a trip. But also, or people, he'll send people in who have skills and abilities that, so things get handled. But you see how different that is from relying on human beings to do the task and praying and relying on the Spirit to handle absolutely everything. And I think the one 
way that I got so into this, the reason my trust level went soaring and the reason I really could trust that it worked was, I mean, I did use the Course as an oracle and for, for like five years from 1986 to 1991, I was very devotional and praying and, and, and journaling and, and going to some Course groups and, and loosening up in my heart. But then when he, he took me on that drive-about trip for five years, that's when I really knew, okay, when you say you'll handle everything, you mean actually everything. A place to sleep. If I need a word of comfort, you're there for me. If I, if I need food, if I need rest. Like he would have me on these long road trips and I would have all these emotions going on and I would, it would be so intense for me when I was driving over long hours in the United States that it was so intense for me that I would I would just pray and I would say please help me out I'm 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 scared I have so much fear coming up and he would say here let's well, here turn to this station or play these cassette tapes or back that was dating it cassette tapes you know <laughs> I'm giving away the age you put in the cassette tape and then you, it flips over and everything then you do the next one the music was a way of calming me on those long road trips. It was a beautiful driving meditation because during my fear I would think, I'm not going to be able to speak to anybody. I'm not going to be able to be loving or kind or helpful to anybody because I'm in too much fear. He'd say, just right now, just trust me. Just listen to the music and keep your eye on the road and relax. Then I'd go for five, six, seven hours to the next town. Somebody would welcome me into their house. I'd relax, they'd take me to a course group or to a church. By the time I got there, I was all relaxed. I thought, well, you're right. I'm, I'm calm. And he'd say, good, I can talk through you now. <laughs> I need you to be calm for me to address. So that's the way it would go. Yeah, and also just I noticed that because guidance is absolutely leading the way, and I saw over these few years here, is that ab guidance is actually one step ahead. And that's part of the reasons a lot of the times when we're stressed and worried and, and ask for an immediate answer to a problem we define in our mind, it doesn't come in like fit in the box because, because Jesus always gives us something normally when our mind can hear, is relaxed. And a lot of the guidance, you know, when, when we together pray in the community, a lot of the guidance that come in, that's just feel like, what? Irrelevant to, the, to, to what we're praying or it's, it's ahead. So a lot of the time when David normally is taking that road to just at the beginning hear a lot of the things that we're like, that doesn't, doesn't feel needed at all, you know, one center came in, we don't need a center. Another center came in, we don't need another center. Another center came in, but... but that's not my plan, I'm just following instructions, and they're like, what for? What could we possibly... It's not our plan. And then everybody, you know, gradually really developed this trust, because as time goes by, everybody's like, oh, wow, it was right. It was glad that somehow we can express and then just relax and, and, and watch. There's one example. At one point, um, suddenly David heard that we're going to set up a holdings corporation. And that is, if you know business, you know holdings corporation is to hold assets, properties, assets. And when that guidance came in, it absolutely made no sense. I got a lot of strange looks. People were like, what does a mystic have to do with setting up a holdings corporation? I said, I don't know. It's Jesus' plan, but, but somehow it's important and we need to do it. And we didn't even have assets or property to, yeah. to yeah. be held. Yeah, that was, that was the strange part. <laughs> right. But, I can't explain it, but this is the guy. It was very, very strange. And then it also, let alone how much it took to set it up, 
because uh, as a nonprofit, it goes through a very, very complicated process with the government to set up a proper holdings corporation. So it's not just a simple thing that doesn't make sense and you can forget. It's actually you have to carry it through with a lot. And I should say, too, when Jesus said to set up a holdings corporation, I'm like, what is a holdings corporation? I have, I have absolutely no idea. I had to go Google it. But that's, I spent a lot of times. He's like, Twitter. I'm like, what's a Twitter? What's a Twitter? Or he would say, Skype. I'd go, what? What's a Skype? You know, I mean, with all the, even the, even the developments in technology, you know, I get the guidance from Jesus and, and I'm wondering, I don't even know what that is. So I, initially I'm thinking, I don't even know what a holdings corporation is. I had to Google it because I don't even know what it is. But the guidance came in. Yeah, that was part of it. And the guidance came in, even though people have all kinds of thoughts, all expressed openly, but there was also underlying trust. Okay, then let's move forward because that's felt. It was guidance and give our, all our effort and time to actually set it up. And I think it got set up and months and months, months passed by. And um, I think we forgot about it. So one day we got an invitation to, to go down to Mexico to actually um, do two gatherings in Guadalajara. This host invited us to do two gatherings. So we, we, we planned for a whole week. And then the first gathering finished, and we were in the car, and we were talking about the next gathering, and, and the host said, I forgot to organize the second one. <laughs> oh, no. So we were like, oh, okay. So we suddenly have a lot of free time for that trip. So there was not really much to do, so we just wandered around our um, host's house around, then walked into... Um, Property agent, is that a property office? A realtor. I was a realtor. A, I was back meditating, but I think you and Suzanne went out and walking around because I was just meditating, and then uh, right, and then there was some kind of property that that looks really amazing, like a monastery in Mexico by the lake. So then David came and went to the the realtor, and the realtor kind of talked about and how well, it was interesting because you were with Suzanne and Suzanne saw the, this property in this big real estate book and she said don't let David see this property <laughs> I mean I'm just down there to do a gathering I'm, I'm meditating don't let David see the property so when they go out and t uh, walking around go to a realtor and saw that book and everything there was a realtor book that either they brought back or they uh, was in the house where we were staying. So I'm just in there flipping around and I go, look, look at this one. <laughs> and then they come back and Suzanne's like, Ugh. so I said, well, we only have one more day before we fly. And I said, on the way to the airport, I would like to see that property and we got a realtor showed it to us, and then Suzanne, who had said, don't let David see the property, she was jumping up and down when she saw it herself, like a little, like a little girl who just was in the candy store. She got so excited. And then, so we hop on the plane, we met, there was a minister who, woke, who slept all the way and woke up and gave us a sign, oh, I'd be glad to help you out if you want to do something down in Mexico and this and that. And then you can tell the rest of the story because we had to get a notario who's yeah. a legal expert. So basically, the second time we 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 were gonna get, we want to have that property, and we went back another trip, and we find uh, this notario. Notario is more like a lawyer, and he just basically said, "Oh, as a foreign uh, resident, you cannot own." a property in Mexico unless you have an organization. So we asked, what does it take to, to, to set up an organization? This is what it takes, annual audit. And it's so complicated, so you complicated. went down a list. A list. How many? Whether it's, like, you wanted things. it religious or 
if it is religious, those are the requirements. If it is non-religious, those none of it. So we said, like, no, no, no. So we no. thought, okay, thanks for letting us know. We can leave in peace. We walk out of the door just to to be informed. That's probably the whole point of the trip. So we walk out of the door. As we were leaving the door, he said, unless of course you have a holdings of corporation, <laughs> <laughs> then you can buy the property directly from a foreign holdings corporation. And we were like. We do, as a matter of fact, which was sitting there for months and months and months. Nobody knew what the purpose was. So that's how our Mexico Center started. Yeah. Sometimes I get a little hint. Like I was traveling all around the world, and and I started to get Jesus started to starts off sometimes like it's some kind of a cat and mouse game. He gives me a couple a couple words, and I'm like. And he started saying, when I would travel around the world, he would say something like, it's like urban ministry. And I'm like, urban ministry? Urban ministry? I said, I, I've been in Buenos Aires, I've been in Beijing, New York City. I mean, I go wherever I'm asked. If there, It could be a, a barn like this in southern Holland. I, but urban ministry, and then it... It felt like with this whole Mexico thing, with the Holdings Corporation, everything he was doing was Guadalajara is very close to where we are, and it's the second largest city in Mexico with millions and millions of people. And somehow I felt like, oh, I think he was hinting, he was just giving little hints, but it's, it's all in the adventure of listen and follow. You know, it, you, you don't, or don't need to know any more than just listen and follow right now. It's really, that's how simple it is. But these are just like examples about how there, you know, when he says, I will make your path straight, I'll go before you, make your path straight with no stones to trip on. These are kind of the living experience. They turn into a bunch of parables because things unfold and, and there's no person that's doing it. It's like there's some kind of it's a divine orchestration that's far beyond human beings that is handling everything. And that's why you start to trust that, that everything is taken care of. You, you start to let go of those roles, those concerns, those worries, you know, that are part of the human construct. You know, I can't, I can't serve you, God, because of whatever reason. You know, the ego always comes up with justifications and reasons that it's got too much going on in this earth plane, on the horizontal plane, to listen and follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, that's not true. You, you can listen and follow me right now if you make that decision. You don't have to keep the guilt from holding on to all these make-believe concepts and this fiction that the egos, I'll help you unwind from that fiction. So it's been very good, very good for all of us. And we were thinking today, too, we would, we would maybe get some witnesses, uh, yeah, to just call people up to, 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 to share. share some of this. Yep. You have a well, Lilo's right there, I see Lilo. Want to come up? Like a trained Broadway singer who's trained to sing on Broadway in New York City, with that high quality of voice, to be so rare, and now you're here running <laughs> live streaming and tech support with this amazing gift that's been trained for years and years and years, kind of like with Emily's opera training. What's it been? How has it been for, on the inside with this, with this trip? For you, how has it gone? Have you, can you think about guidance points or points where you seem to reach like a point in your life where you had some kind of a calling or something strong coming to you intuitively, even though there seem to be lots of options in terms of the world?
I mean, it's like, it's like an, I feel like it's, it happens so much, actually, in the, during the day, if I'm really open for it, in just the smallest things, I'm starting to ask more and then just follow, just speak. I feel like um, that's really been a big lesson. Like, it's, the lesson has been more clear I think coming more forward lately, like, yeah, Emily has been saying over and over, you just have to speak, you just have to speak, 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 and then I do, and sometimes it's really not how I want it to look, and then I have to give that over, and then I do see... Uh, it's it's just you. It's just you who is giving me this, and then it like it gives me this opportunity to, yeah, to just sit back, to step back and let him take it and judge it. Um, that's I think has been so incredible. That it's like the smallest things where I see. Yeah, that I just ask what now, and then I just hear mm, turn on the mic or look at that chair or um, yeah, move this. It's okay, okay, and then I just go there, and then yeah. That's so huge, though, because it's going from a personality self. You know, we're taught we are in charge of our own person, and in some cases we're even trained to be in charge of other people, <laughs> like managers or parents or whatever. And then we come into this place where you're like going through a day and getting these little prompts, turn this on, go here, go there, and easing and relaxing into almost just being carried by that, or even speaking up where the personality of Lilo would not. And then it just wants, something wants to be spoken through. And, and just the willingness to allow that is, is literally washing away the people-pleasing of trying to hold on to a personality self and maintain control. And, and that's where the trust seems to come in. It's in the small little day-to-day -day things that come in, those little nuances. It's not in big, flashy things. Uh, in fact, I do remember even from the Bible and stories in the Urantia book how uh, with Jesus, a lot of times there would be these, what the world would call miraculous experiences, like really miraculous experiences. And Jesus would say things like, tell no man. Almost like, this is all for you. <laughs> tell no man. You don't have to go running around trying to draw attention to this form thing. This is natural. Or he would say, by your faith you were healed. You know? Or remember that time when somebody came up behind him and just touched the hem of his garment, and he went, who touched me? <laughs> but, the, but the woman who came up just to touch the hem of his garment had such faith in healing that she experienced an immediate healing from just touching the hem of his garment. And he says, who touched me? <laughs> you, know, you see how, how involuntary, how natural it is. So I'm, thank you for coming up here and just sharing that because these are the how subtle the little nuances, just as you go through your day, it doesn't seem a lot like to the world, but in terms of listen and follow, those are like huge trust and huge step, because you're letting go of like personal control of, of the, the puppet, really. You know, that's, that's no small thing when you think about it. 
And Helen Shuckman, of course, went through that when she was scribing, because there were times she thought, I am not going to write another thing down, and I've got a life, and I've got a husband, and I've got a career here, and, you know, it, there was a bit of bucking that goes on with all of us when we start to surrender to the flow of the current that wants to just take us, take us back. Yeah, and in that, like, I'm not even thinking anymore about what I did before the career and all that. It's, yeah, just takes me more and more into what now. And then there was no, yeah, you say, oh, she did this and this and this. And it's like, right. And a little earlier, someone asked me about my age. <laughs> it's like, oh, I get so more and more drawn to, to what do I need to communicate now because I see that um, there's a lot of compromise or a lot of holding back. And when I do communicate, there is just this uh, surrender into, yeah, like that we're all doing it together. And the, the moment I don't communicate something, I hold this private thought, I hold something back, then something spins out or there is just, I f don't feel so connected to the team anymore, to everybody. And uh, um, I s start seeing that it's, that's where the joy lies, to just be connected. It's so beautiful. And also, as we, Francis was sharing too, no skills are ignored. So, so there are these beautiful collaborations that you've had uh, with Emily and with Emily and Svava. I think, you know, there's the Beatles, the Monkees. This group is the final vision. So you might get to hear, perhaps we'll be able to hear the final vision. Lilo, Svava, and Emily uh, come together, get the band reunited here in Holland for an encore performance. Because it's still, everything gets used. And even the things that were there, you know, nothing, it just used in an involuntary way. It, you, you know how spontaneous that was. You were just thinking about sending some lyrics and then didn't you get a, a message or a call from Svava? Wasn't there something like synchronistic about even the idea of coming together to collaborate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's another one of those little miracles, mm -hmm. like. Yeah, it just, just happens. It's like, oh, I was thinking about this, or I had this strong feeling, and then all of a sudden it just shows up. Like, yeah. it just shows up, and yeah, and now as well, when do we practice? We haven't practiced yet. And it's like, okay, just step back. I'll show you the moment. It'll be shown, and you'll feel, yeah. It, he's just over and over telling me, you'll, you'll feel it. You'll feel it when it's, when it's the right moment. So I'm just waiting till, <laughs> till we'll rehearse. <laughs> that's it. it's, to me, that's the, the joy is just any little reflection of trust and any, any amount of like, well, we'll just see what's coming or we'll let it be shown to us is so much fun. Like even last night after the movie I I left my my cell phone. You can tell how I don't really put so much care into it. I left it here. It was, I didn't put it to bed last night. It was here and I I went back over across the whole way and I was in there and I was in the bathroom and then suddenly the thought came you left your cell phone in the hall and I came out and I turned out and just before I could say I left my cell phone at the hall Kirsten had messaged Slava and, Slava and Kirsten had said I've got your cell phone I'll bring it to you it all happened simultaneously and to me that's the sweetness here's the thought I left my cell phone here's the thought I have your cell phone I'm bringing it to you that they arose at the very same moment. It's almost like Jesus going, I got everything under control, even, lo even cell phones that are left behind. You don't miss a thing, I do. <laughs> you see every move I make. You know, there's nothing that slips by the care and the love. And, and the, after a while you start to just appreciate all the synchronicities showing how cared for you are. And I think that's 
That's beautiful. So I, let's all hold that in prayer. That'd be fun to hear the final vision <laughs> sing together. And how that will be arranged with practice and everything, I have to trust it will happen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's see. I'm thinking maybe Kirsten, can you come up? Yeah. Kirsten was coming here to share among all of us um, teaching here and also that just became at some point quickly into the retreat that that there was a calling for some guidance and leadership with tech with the tech team because again the tech team is not trained as a tech team <laughs> they are just showing up with a bunch of technology <laughs> And these aren't people that have been working on tech for years or decades and are professionals, but everyone doing tech is just showing up to practice, listen and follow. And then you were called in to help out with that, to join and connect in mind, in prayer. So it's, it's always something new. We, we have no idea what, what it's all for or how will you be used. Yes, I've never overseen a tech team or operated a camera <laughs> before, but yeah, it was just obvious. I, I happened to walk in when there was a sound check, and I could hear everything, like it was mine. And so, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Those I words know. are emphasized. I could hear everything. <laughs> Jesus is having some fun. <laughs> yeah, it was like that. <laughs> so I said to Emily, I can feel it. Like I, I need to be in the sound team. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I, I, I need to be in the sound team. She came back to me two hours later and she said, actually, could you oversee the tech team? I was like, whoa, what does that mean? <laughs> But I could feel it, like, yes, however I can, I can best serve. This is, like, the most important thing, I feel, is the message and the content coming out. And when David's on fire, you know, <laughs> and he and Francis are, like, paired up and on fire, then, yeah, whatever I can do to support that, um, that content, getting out clearly to everyone, I'm, I'm all in. So, Even though you need a baseball cap... You can use this lovely book as a visor for you right now. Use that as your visor. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's for reading and for sunblock, depending on whatever the Holy Spirit wants to use it uh, at, a, at any given time. Because the book is titled, I Married a Mystic, and, and actually, I'm trying to remember when we first met, was it around 2004 or so? So it's about 15 years ago we met uh, in New Zealand and then um, Kirsten was not really a part of most of the gatherings. Your mother and another woman named Mia from uh, Sweden had organized most of the gatherings. But uh, Kirsten started having a lot of people, a lot of people saying to her, I hear you're going to Cincinnati with David to the Peace House. She said, what? And I hear you're going to the Peace House, the next person. I hear you're going to the United States. What? 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 Imagine having a bunch of people telling you something that you have no clue, but it's the same message. That's a good example of the Holy Spirit speaking through brothers and sisters, where it wasn't something she had heard, but she kept hearing it over and over. And she had the courage and the, the faith to hop on that plane, even though she had a disability, and she'd had two major kind of crashes and everything, and she was on disability payments and still some headaches and difficulty sleeping. She flew all the way to the other side of the world. And then thus began our collaborations of being used in different travels, at times there at the Peace House, Knoxville, Tennessee, different things. And then journals, which are so helpful 
if you don't have somebody to speak to all the time, to be able to journal with, with the Spirit, to journal with Jesus or whatever, there were journal notes that were kept uh, from these early days and early travels, and wasn't it about nine or ten years the, the journals were kept somehow miraculously to, yeah. to help in the making of the book? Yeah. Yeah, I... Um so every day I would wake up and I would just go straight to the couch for my early morning date with the Holy Spirit and sit there and pray with a pen and, and journal and just open up and start sharing my mind. And these conversations I, I had and just working through undoing the ego and when you're with such a clear, bright mirror <laughs> like David, I could so clearly see my ego you know, with this presence of happiness that's there, I could see, oh, I'm not happy, and I can't, it's, it's so obvious. So I cleared through things, they came into my awareness through this journaling, and with this support so fast, and um, so we thought, well, they need to be shared. So at that time, there was an online mailing list that, that you had, um, a Yahoo group, and so I started sharing these journal experiences on this group with about a thousand people and at first it was scary it was like oh my god these are my like private thoughts and my facing the ego experiences but every time I shared one I would get these reflections back from people saying thank you so much oh my god I'm, I can relate I'm going through exactly the same thing so over the course of three years a lot of them were shared online and um and then after that, actually it was Jackie, my mother, <laughs> who collected them all. And she, she got them all together and put them all on Word documents and did a little bit of minor editing and said, here, you need these. And people in the following years, um, they would come across these writings online and say, oh my God, you have to put these into a book. And year after year after year, I would, someone would say that and I would feel, no, it's not time. And then 10 years later to the day, now this is what, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like that. <laughs> 10 years, yeah, it's just really profound. So when I would sit and write up these journals, like they were so deep, it was my relationship with God, you know, developing and so I would sit at this desk in the peace house. We had this little four-bedroom peace house in Cincinnati. Just David and I and two cats. That's how the community started. Um, and I would sit at this desk and type up these notes and put them online. And ten years later to the day, um, I heard from Jesus, it's time, write the book. And I thought, wow, that that's great, but... I, I don't know how to write a book. And then a friend of ours in the community, Ricky, she just, out of the blue, started hearing this prompt that she was going to write a book. So she wrote an email to us and she said, I'm hearing to write a book, but I don't have a book to write. <laughs> My story, believe me, is not worth telling yet. <laughs> what does it mean? And I said, wow, do you want to help me write my book? And she was like, that's it. So I sent her all of those journals that were in the document. She read through them and went into a mystical experience. She was like, oh, my God, this is it. So we met back at the Peace House that had been empty for about a year. We went to the Peace House to spend three months for this book to come through. So here I was, 10 years later to the day, sitting at the desk <laughs> that I'd written up the original journals to finish writing the book. And I know it had to be 10 years later because I had to be in a state of mind where I could go through this revisiting of what I'd gone through 10 years before. Um, so that it could come through with humor and a, you know, a, a bigger awareness of, of what was really happening. Because at that time, it was so fast. I didn't even have time to process everything. I was with such a fast-moving mystic. You know, it was take a leap of faith, take a leap of faith. You'll understand this later on. <laughs> Just keep going, keep going. 
So, yeah. And these notes, I mean, at least Helen, when she took her shorthand down, and she went from 1965 to 1972, but Jesus, he wouldn't tell what was coming. I mean, when they started, and she said, she heard, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. For all she knew, she was going to get a couple pages of notes. Uh, she didn't know that she'd be going for seven years taking notes. Imagine, he, he didn't, he, the Spirit doesn't do that. Doesn't, it doesn't tell you what you're really getting into. In the Bible, in the red letters from Jesus, it said, To those whom much is given, much will be required. And he doesn't really tell you in the Bible what that required part is. It's amazing what is required when so much is given. But what I like about it, too, is that here Ricky was thinking, write a book, write a book, and she was so integral to be called in by you to, to write the book because the, these notes were not necessarily organized. It, you know, you may have had some dates, but it's like you're dealing with like a kaleidoscope of, of gems. And then I know for a lot of you, it's like Lilo was just saying, even the memories of, of some of the things from recent years have just gone. Uh, and I think that's what had happened for you. Over 10 years, you can forget a lot of the details. So there were lots of holes. It was more like Swiss cheese with... There was some good cheese there and there was lots of holes. And then Ricky seemed to come in to be able to listen, listen, and then say, but what happened between this and this? And how did you go from here to there? And she was the one that was part of a, a, another collaboration to pull it out. Because Jesus ultimately is orchestrating the book even. Uh, bringing in, you just get the hint about writing a book, then Ricky, and then you're there, your mother had kept the notes, and then the filling in was one thing, and then the editing, it was uh, kind of like Francis with her movie, with all this footage, it's like a massive editing to really get down to, Jesus, what do you want? What do you want to share? You see how different that is from like having earthly standards for a book. It's more like what is it that's essential that will really be for you and for the whole. So that's a, another example of what we were just talking about, about doing it for the whole is so different. And you never thought of yourself as an author, you know, or a public speaker, or anything. You, you know, you even had to go back, wasn't it, for your GED equivalent of for like a high school diploma. Yeah, I dropped out when I was 14. Yeah, she dropped out. I quit the world. <laughs> yeah, you even at a younger age, you kind of took a hike one time and left home at what? Four. When she was four years old, she left home. And her mother watched her, you know, and she helped pack the bag and watched her defiantly walk away <laughs> and trusting Jackie and then you came back and that was a big you had that moment and then at 14 was another big one but there was something already that was hinting at you are not of this world you know and I know probably in this whole room none of us left home at four I mean honestly you know you have to have some kind of spunk to to go walking out the door with your bags packed it's one thing to leave when you're 14, but four, you know. So all of it, it's like Jesus is using everything that's, that, that's there for a higher purpose, yeah. for the oneness. Yeah. yeah, I was, but then I ended up pretty good at leaving. You know, we're all good at leaving. And so there was a point where Jesus actually said to me, okay, that's enough now. You're good at walking out. There's another door I want you to go through now and I want you to stay oh. so I feel that's actually what a lot of the training is is to stay can I stay and face this can I stay not necessarily in the physical environment you know there are times where you are to to move but in terms of in the mind can I stay and face this can I move through this and and let the spirit keep guiding like the timing of things yeah I thought this would take three months because I, and I didn't have any judgment as to an external audience. What would this be like for someone else to read? I, 
I had no idea. I didn't have that kind of ability. After, after so much focus on the spirit in my own mind, I couldn't really do that. And so then an editor, a professional editor came in, and so after the first three months, she said, oh, no, we haven't even started. This is going to take layers and layers and layers of editing for it to reach a point where everything is, is, is a gift. There's nothing repetitive. And even that felt like such a mind-training process, like going through, like taking out anything extraneous, taking out anything that's not necessary. So each step of the way felt like it was a real gift for all of us, for our mind, yeah, for prayer. I think that's the thing. Even when you said that thing about you, you weren't thinking of it as for an audience, and that's the same process. Hopefully we'll be able to hear at some point Francis talk about that because in making a movie, she wasn't really making it for an audience. She had to make it as given from Jesus as if it's all for her, which is, this is for all of us. We have to learn to, th to think and pray and act and flow as if it was for the whole universe coming through us and as if we are an audience of one. We're not trying to tailor this to a particular readership to make money, whether it's a book or it's a movie. I know it's fascinating for me because I've, I've gone to these massive conferences that are like 400, 50, 500 people, and I've been doing them uh, since 2007. And when I went there and I got up in front of 500 people, it was kind of fascinating because they would introduce me as an author. And I would be like, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Here I am, I give my life to Jesus, and I'm reading a book that says, God is the author of reality. And if you think you are the author of anything, you have an authority problem. <laughs> That's what the Course is teaching, really. That you can't author yourself, you can't create yourself, you are not the author of yourself, is the teaching of the Course. You are not an author, you will never be an author. You were authored by God, and God is the author of reality, and you can but accept yourself as being authored by God. And if you believe anything other than that, Jesus says you have a major authority problem. So you can only imagine going and walking up in front of 500 people and they say, now we'd like to introduce David Hoffmeister. David's an author and he's authored so many books. I have. Did I? I mean, I'm a talking mystic. I just talk. I don't really write books. I, I talk, people record them, people transcribe them, editors come in, they do whatever you have to do to make a book, and they put it typesetting. I know nothing of typesetting. I do not sit down and, I've never sat down and think, I'm going to write a book. And with Kirsten too, this is perfect hearing your story too, because it really gives the feel like everything we think and say and do can come from God, but there's no sense of personal ownership with anything because there is no possession, there is no personality, there is no possession. So when people say, oh, I want to interview you for a radio show, I want to, I, I, it's, I just want to have, a, you're just an, an author and I want to have the new book that you've authored and I'm still thinking, what? What? Because for me, I find it absolutely impossible to be identified with author. To me, that's a, a concept that, that doesn't fit with my experience of A Course in Miracles. The present moment, yeah, I can, I can go for that. Devoted to, to presence and love, mystic, I can go for that. Okay, that's a fine symbol. Author, yipes, what is that, you know? But thank you for sharing that because I think with this book and with any books that seem to come, this is still all like a backdrop for us to for listen and follow. You know, there, there ultimately is no product in listen and follow. You're always in just that mode of, show me the way. I would but follow, you lead the way. And then these things are the props. You can use them for sun visors, see, they work really well for that. If the sun's in your eye, but it, it, it can be, you can read it, you can look at the pictures, 
you know, it's, it's just a prop. Imagine thinking of your own body, so to speak, your own, as just a prop. Just think how relaxing that is. Your stress will start to go away because you don't have to put so much thought and care into something that's just a prop on a stage. And there's a bigger, uh, someone's moving the crossbow of the, of the puppet and it's, it's not a personal you, you know. I mean, Wayne Dyer, I love Wayne, and he did a book early on called Pulling Your Own Strings. And I would say now, he's with us right now laughing, going, yeah, I, I could have called that letting the spirit pull my strings instead of pulling my own strings, because that's really what it is. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Soren, are you, you're behind the camera, but that camera looks like it's doing a pretty good job. You, you want to come, come up here? Jesus has got the camera. <laughs> uh. mm, beautiful. I thought I was safe there. <laughs> he said, I thought I was safe there. <laughs> Behind the camera. There we go. Well, you all get to experience uh, Soren in the, in the movie that's coming up too, and just the, the willingness and the love and the devotion. But um, considering the topic we've been talking about today, uh, it's kind of fascinating because for a lot of us, we tend to be used by Jesus in projects and areas where we have absolutely no clue. Like me building websites with no training in HTML and any type of coding or anything. I was just like, you know, at first I'm just laughing going, are you kidding me? And then he's like, sit down at the computer and put your fingers on the, <laughs> the keyboard and I'll take it from there. And I'm like, you're going to channel a website? <laughs> this is really freaky, but okay. But the thing about Soren is, maybe you can bring some light to this, is that, that the more you've come forth and everything, it seems like you've lived many lifetimes in this lifetime, and you've developed, Soren has developed so many skills, and none of us knew about them. It's like Jesus is, is sending Soren in to say, yeah, well, uh, I've, I'm going to use Soren in ways you can't even imagine, like, like, uh, like shipbuilding. I, do, I don't think I've ever met somebody who has shipbuilding skills, but those seem to generalize into a, a lot of other things, like working with wood, building a loft, uh, constructing things, and I, it seems like Maybe in your case, you went through the ego process of, of devoting yourself and really being open to learn all these skills, and now it's almost like Jesus is using the skills in some kind of a way, like playing an instrument, whereby we, we have things that come up and we have no clue, and then Soren's like, I can do that. And we're like, you can? That's amazing. Oh, I can do that. He's just been able to step in with all of these skills, like uh, many different instruments that Jesus uses. I, I will share that one example that we have a monastery where we have a house. And um, one time we were looking and the whole top half of the house, it's, it's built with wood, but the whole second floor and the roof and everything is built of wood. And then there's a big, giant, huge log that's like a cross beam that holds the second floor and the roof of this house together. And then one year, we happened to be out there and we were walking through the house and we could see that that big, giant log that kind of holds the top half of the house was rotting. 
And so the house, the top half of the house, is sitting on a rotting log that holds the whole thing. And we're like looking, we're like, Jesus. It's like, we are not carpenters, maybe you were, but we are not carpenters. <laughs> we are not, we are not experienced in logs. We're trying to get the log out of our own eye. Like you told us, you know, before you get the, the beam out of your brother's eye, get the log out of your own. But how are we going to get the log? I mean, it just, honestly, when we looked at it, we said, this is an impossible situation. You know, are you going to have to dismantle the whole, take the whole roof and the whole second floor off because there was a rotten log right through, right through the middle of the house, too. And it's all tucked in there and there's other things. And so we were just going, let's just pray. Well, we had a, a visitor that showed up to come to our community from, from Ireland. And uh, he went over with some other people and they took him into the house and they were talking about the impossible log and the impossible situation. He said, oh, I can replace that for you. We're like, what? Oh yeah, I can replace that. I'll replace that log for you. And we're just like, okay. And it turns out this guy was like a master builder. He got hydraulic jacks and he lifted the top half of the house up off of the log. And he replaced that log. And every time I go into that monastery house now and I sit there to meditate, I just stare and look at that log and I go, with God all things are possible. That's, that's a reminder of that. And, and for you, how has it been? Because when you came first to Mexico, you know, you didn't know what you were getting yourself into with this whole mind training thing. And then when you were asked to participate in a movie, uh, there was a, probably an internal mental process you went through, but but going back to just coming to Mexico and then what has come since then, it seems like there's been a lot of miracles that have been happening, but how has that been for you internally? Yeah, I, I talked to Francis the other day um, about that this whole process, uh, first I invited Francis to Copenhagen three years ago, I think, and and that was kind of the beginning of this relationship with the living miracles and uh, and I, and and she asked me do you want to be part of this movie team and uh, and i've even even the beginning of inviting Francis and Jenny to Copenhagen felt like like an a prompt it felt like a prompt i i was depressed and i was Closed down, and and it felt I have to do something, you know. It was like I have to do something, you know. And then this Facebook ad came up, you know. We we would like to come to Copenhagen. Okay, I have to do something, <laughs> and and that was the beginning. And and I felt with the movie project, yeah, I it was like I just began to say yes. Even and, that was. Miraculous, because what I remember talking to Jenny and Francis, they were communicating with you after they had agreed to come to Copenhagen, and then there weren't a lot of people that were signing up, so then they were saying, maybe we should just cancel the trip. And you knew somewhere deep inside that this was like really important. Like, no, I really think you're to be here. I think, did Svava come to that one too? Yes. Svava yes. showed up there. And? Caulfield. And Ann Caulfield, and all these things that would have like major ramifications, kind of like the movie yesterday when the, the, the lyrics were being passed by Ray over yeah. to, to yeah. Elton, and it basically they slowed the movie down because it was like this big event that would end up being this lifelong relationship between him and this writer. And for you, it was kind of that same thing. Yeah. That gathering sounds like it was very uh, 
very strongly guided, like it was life or death for you. Yeah, it, 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 I, it, I didn't do it. You know, there was something that wanted to do that <laughs> through me because I don't normally invite people from the other end of the world to Copenhagen. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for some reason, it just had to happen, and, and, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. And, and it was the same thing. You know, with the movie project, I had an, my own project going, and uh, you know, and uh, I had really forgotten about it. But then, it's it was just this yes. I I had to say yes, and 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 later after the movie project, I came to Mexico and uh, and editing with Francis, and and then it was kind of over, and then. You asked me to be part of the studio team, and it was just, yeah, I feel I. It was, you know, yes, I, I, I want to, but every time it was like I said yes to this, and then when I got into it, oh no, this was not what I said yes to. <laughs> that sounds like that. For those who much is given, much will be required. Yeah, that's what my experience too. Like, oh no, <laughs> what have I signed up for? <laughs> yeah. Where is this heading? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because somehow you know, you, you know, I was confronted with a lot of, you know, I know, you know, I know how to do this, you know, and I know how to do this, and that state of mind is not required in this uh, community. <laughs> you're you're describing all your resistances but I have to tell you from from the other perspective like when you were coming to Mexico I the people around me were so happy that you were coming I mean really happy they were like Soren's coming Soren's coming to Mexico I remember Lisa and Suzanne were like Soren's coming to Mexico and he's going to need a place to stay and they went running out the door to go house hunting to find a house so that you could come and, and rent a house and stay in. And then when they came back, they had all these holy encounters and they said, we found the house and we're so happy. And they, But from your perspective, you're like, oh, what am I getting myself into? This is a big deal, going across the ocean and everything. And then the people around you seem to it's just, I think, the joy of the spirit where they felt like, like a long-lost friend is now coming into the, the play. And they were so excited about you coming. And, and I know even that was, you know, get, go, walking, not having a car at the beginning, walking there to the Walmart to, yeah. to get the groceries and everything. It was very different, I'm sure, from uh, Copenhagen, like landing on a different planet. It was. It was. And... Uh, yeah, it was so different because somehow I was so engaged in the project and I felt it was very important to me. And and I also f felt it was so gentle, you know, because I came to Mexico and I had my own house, you know. It was an ease into... You know, I could still sit and smoke, and I could drink a glass of wine, and you know, so <laughs> still could keep Soren there, yes, yeah. a bit of Soren. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, there was this very gentle process, and uh, and I feel it's been like that from the beginning. You know that that I I I want to let go of this very very fixed self concept you know i want to let go but you know i'm still i i still feel here you know that oh i know and i have to say to other people what i know <laughs> and so there is this constantly you know giving up and giving up and giving up of uh, and um and i just you know today just this morning i was just so relaxed, you know, because somehow this beginning of this retreat has been so, you know, unknown. We didn't know what we, go, what we were going to getting into, yeah. and I just felt this tension, you know, you know, I'm responsible or I'm responsible, and Kirsten says, you know, and I and I don't feel I'm in control, so 
I, you know, I had this joining with Kirsten, and she said, I'm joining you in this, uh, we have no control. <laughs> and it was like, okay, we have no control. Good. <laughs> Yeah, that would be, talk about being between a rock and a hard place. If you feel responsible for things being a certain way and you feel you have no control, that's like, some of you have felt that with children, with, you know, like, I'm supposed to be, I'm like the mom, I'm supposed to be uh, controlling them, but this is out of my control. And then it's almost like there's a feeling like, is, am I doing something wrong? Because there's something, a critique going on in there, like, I should, I'm supposed to measure up to something. And it takes a lot of, of mind training, I think, to let that go, that idea that you have to measure up in some way. You can't just relax and be used by the spirit. Right. Yeah, it, it is a major thing, you know. Uh, you know, I didn't know what I was coming into when I joined this movie team, you know. But, and, it, and I can just say, you know, when we came here and the first night we had this dinner here before every of you came and I was just sitting at that table feeling so grateful because I was with the people I loved the most in the whole world it was so beautiful and I'm you know I'm just very grateful for being in this process even though it sometimes you know it's just you know yeah, tense. <laughs> Everyone can relate. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Okay, very good. Thank you. And, and Emily, you want to come up and share a bit? Francis mentioned a, a number of things that, about Emily being trained in opera and then and then, yeah, I think none of us know all the steps we're going to go through, but there's a lot, and think over the past few years. And we came over here hearing it was a castle, but I think Emily and I, didn't we meet in a, in a castle? We did meet in a castle <laughs> in Ireland. <laughs> An old, like medieval castle. And uh, that's been, there's been a lot of unwindings that have happened there, and... So it's been intense, very intense at times, and sometimes it probably feels like your whole world is is spinning and the 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 wheels are coming off and so on and so forth. But but maybe you can share a bit about about what it is that this devotion to Christ and this deep deep heartfelt devotion that actually there have been a number of amazing saints over here in Europe throughout history and now you're looking at St. Emily. Oh, uh, she, people don't like that when I say that I, and I say, well, you're at least a saint in training. Uh, we're all saints in training, right? I tell everybody we're all saints in training so don't get all hung up about that word. But uh, maybe you can just share of, of what it is that's, that's deep inside you that, that like calls you or compels you you know, for what this is all leading to. It's pretty deep. Kirsten told me to bring it to you. <laughs> bring a whole box. <laughs> We've got some time. Bring a whole box. Yeah, it's kind of like I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but I, yeah, I just, I just feel so grateful for everything that's been given to me. <laughs> and yeah, really just, for for this community and um like just the like the the purpose that's underneath that everything that we do is for one purpose for healing and um 
I was just thinking when when Francis was just sharing how I had um, you know trained as an opera singer before I came into the community and and has seemingly I've done many other projects that aren't necessarily connected with singing. There's the bodily fluids. <laughs> <laughs> Thereby showing us that you can let it out and uh, no matter what or where or, or when. <laughs> we don't care about that part. But yeah, um, because it can seem like even that that could be seen as a sacrifice. Like because we always talk about, you know, we do what serves the whole. It's out of this personal perspective or even personal inspiration or, yeah, anything from the personal. Like, we're transcending that, and that's where the guidance... When the guidance comes in, it's always with a much bigger picture of what serves the whole. But I was just thinking when Francis was sharing that, that um, <clears throat> it's not separate because you know, what seemingly serves the whole and what's seemingly given for me to step into is exactly what I need. There's no sacrificing what I need for the spirit. And even though that may come up, but it's just coming up to be washed because I can't see, I can't see the end goal. I can't see where the spirit is leading me. I can only see from this very limited perspective of what I think I need based on what I think my needs are, but the mind is so confused, I have no clue. And so with the singing, it's just actually been really profound for me because I had to step out of singing. I had to step fully out of singing because there was so much judgment in my mind in that area that it was like a huge block and the spirit couldn't use my voice. Um, there was so much self-judgment, there was so much, yeah, just distortion in my mind around that whole area that the spirit is like, okay, let, let's go over here for a little while. <laughs> like, let's step out of that. And then it flipped to the other side. I don't want to ever sing again. Like, I could feel that that was coming in. And then the spirit would be like, okay, let's sing. <laughs> and... Um, and so nothing has been stripped away. It's like everything is purely for healing. And um, when I when I sing now, it's to it's for healing. When I don't sing, it's for healing. And and I just see that. Um, I think the gratitude I was just feeling at the beginning was seeing how much I'm being given to heal. Like, and I feel in the last whatever, since I came to Europe last March, that it's been like an acceleration. It's just this huge, huge speed up. And it's seemingly the more the spirit asks of me, the more I receive. Like it's... Like I'm being given so many opportunities to give. (laughs) But I need them, because it's the only way I can receive. You're like the embodiment of that line in the Bible about, to those who much is given, much will be required. Because I know for yourself, and I know for myself, I could not have even, in my wildest imaginations, had any idea of all the steps I would be put through by saying yes. You know, I just, I knew I had to say yes, and I knew that was for the whole, and I knew that was for my happiness. I could feel that intuitively, but I had no idea of what it would be going through. It's, it's kind of like um, the Alice in Wonderland story. It's like going down the rabbit hole. And then when you go down the rabbit hole, things don't look anything like you thought they would look. And that's where the faith really comes in. Because just undoing from the singing, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be an opera singer, no, I won't sing at all. And then you had to really relax to allow yourself to have some fun with the singing, try some different styles and do new things. I know when we had the studio down there, you were kind of like a little girl gleefully going in, experimenting with 
I knew things I'd never even heard uh, on the planet before. She was experimenting with, with her voice and types of music and, and it was like getting into that playfulness like, oh, okay, you got me, spirit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go of all my ideas and I have about singing. I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me, to really let go and say, you use it for your purposes, you use it for the whole universe. To take the parameters off, then the, the guilt is gone. And I think also, because Emily and I have been joining a lot actually this year over here on an island in the Mediterranean where um, Emily's been involved before. We, we have had a, a temporary center over here some years ago called Alazena. It was near Malaga and then near La Lacuna. Uh, we had Casa Mixi and now here we are on an island out in the Mediterranean. And um, I said, um, before everybody went down to Mexico, uh, I tried to prepare everybody for the forgiveness lessons <laughs> that would come with Mexico, going to that culture. I said, think of it as uh, you're on a trip to Jupiter and you're landing on Jupiter and you know nothing of Jupiter. That's the best place, that's the best state of mind to be in when you're moving to Mexico. Just think of your, your landing in Jupiter. Oh, look, there's gravity here. Yeah, you better just keep it really, because if you have any expectations, wham, bam, wham, they're going to get hit so hard. You may want to leave Mexico after <laughs> a couple weeks. But we've had two temporary centers and now with us joining there were so many miracles uh, just around this center because the, the guidance seemed to be that we would be establishing not renting a center but actually purchasing a center here in Europe. And uh, for me I, that's kind of strong guidance from Jesus like okay you're going to have to go before us and show us if we're going to establish a center over here in Europe. And then you and I have had all these joinings uh, even up to the day of the closing on the property. You can share a little bit about how that went where we weren't sure if the property would close or not. I mean we were asked if we could come to breakfasts with the family, the own owners, on the morning of the closing, like was it like an hour before, and then walk in to the notario's office and we were just praying and it was like, well let's go have some fun here. I don't know what's going to happen, whether we'll have a house or not, or whether, you know, we just really had to let go of all expectations and you were really right in the middle of that with all the details with the family. So maybe you can share, it's almost like going down on a water slide uh, and just not holding on to the side at all, just like really letting the water take you. Yeah, it was really amazing because those first three months you were there with me and just to, um, yeah, just like what Frances was saying, you know, in those early days with you, she would just like watch you as a demonstration, and I could just really feel that. It seemed like there were all of these things happening, like things wouldn't go as planned, or yeah, it would just things would be a lot slower than we expected, or there were all of these new seeming issues that would come in that we had no clue about. And I remember we were sitting in the car one day, and you just said, we're not responsible for controlling the form. Like, we're just responsible for staying in the present moment and staying with Jesus and following what he would have us do. And just in that, my mind was able to relax. It's like, we're never going to be able to get all the ducks in a row, but it's like, in the midst of all of that, just to come back and, and ask, what is it now? And I think, yeah, that last morning was a great example of that as well because we, we went for breakfast just before we were going to go and sign with, with the family and it seemed like there was this whole list of unresolved things and we were like, okay, well, and we we're willing to let it go that we would even purchase the property. It's like there, there's no investment to, okay, even to an hour before there's a signing and there's been so much prayer and mind energy gone in that direction. It's like in that moment, it could completely be dropped if that was 
the Spirit's will. So we just show up and fully communicate, share all of the thoughts, and then just open to the miracle. And there was a miracle. It was like you were just you were calling the, the mother, the matriarch, <laughs> the other day. She stepped in and she said, "Yeah, this is. I can't even remember all of the specifics around it now, but it was like, no, we have a relationship. And and at the end of the day, that's what it came back to. It's like let's forget about all of these seemingly seeming problems on the surface. Like, what was the initial?" Um, intention behind this property being sold and it was that there was a deep love underneath and a relationship like there was something so much deeper and just before we signed it came back to the simplicity of that and yeah it was really beautiful it's fun to live your life this way you know most people think you go in to sign for a house that involves all these legal things you know as this kind of a you go in and even that, you know, I'm not a resident over here, so guess who has power of attorney? Uh, she's like going <laughs> to sign, and then hundreds of issues over the, the months, hundreds of issues come up, including even on the final day before, and then even on the morning, and then even in the notario's office. We were in there for, what, two or three hours. It was swirling around, and I'm just as clueless as Mr. Magoo, just sitting there, she's the one with the pen uh, who's got to sign the thing so I'm going to witness and watch it but anyway, we're going around, around, around and, and uh, finally it all came down to a phone call call mama uh, to see whether this is going to happen or not and uh, so the, she, the daughter calls if David wants this house, David gets this house <laughs> like bowling, just knocks over all the remaining <laughs> issues but it's really Jesus. It's behind it all. If, you know, if something's meant to happen, there's nothing that can prevent it from happening. And if something's not meant to happen, there's nothing that can make it happen. Imagine if you could live your life in that state of mind. That would take the personal out of it. You would just say, oh, well, let all things be exactly as they are because I'm not in control. But there is one. There is one who knows my, my best interests. There is one that knows the pathway back to oneness and eternal love. And that one is in charge. So be you in charge. You know, that's the, how the Course in Miracles ends, those last five lessons. This holy instant, what I give to you, be you in charge. So we're just really, we just practice with the backdrop of this whole center with that one idea. And it just, you know, it builds trust. And just what's been so amazing for me the last few months with the center getting set up and our first wave of devotional stays coming, I'm planning for this uh, retreat as well, just seeing that it's like really it's all for me. Like even if it seems on the surface that there might be problems or things to yeah, to, to get clear that it's actually all just a reflection of my mind and whatever is showing up is the only way that I can see what's in my, my unconscious mind. Like it's all a reflection of that. And just such a deep trust when a function is given and that is felt. And that's why I'm so grateful for the community as well because I'm not deciding by myself what my function is based on whatever you know, filter I am seeing through, that I'm joined with those whose devotion is to healing and, and to God, and there's no other purpose. And then, so when it becomes clear, well, this is the function I'm to step forward with, there's a full trust that no matter what happens, it can't be that anything's gone wrong because it's Jesus' plan. So everything that's showing up is my lesson. And every single person that comes to the center, whether it's somebody coming to fix the internet or somebody coming for a devotional stay or whatever it might be, they're all opportunities for me to listen and follow and to, to keep communicating and keep communicating. And in that, my mind is being healed and I don't even understand how because I don't even know what it is in my mind that needs to get healed and how could I possibly heal without having these opportunities and these interactions and then having the spirit um, 
yeah, just give me the step, step by step. And, and what's been so powerful is that really I can trust that the spirit is there and I can trust what I feel. Like I can trust because the function is given to me that, that it's not me who's, who's doing it. It is the spirit. And then to keep moving forward with that and be shown over and over again that there's something so beyond me and so much greater than the personal self that's doing everything. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. And, and Emily, for those that will be coming to the center and practicing mind training and everything, this is your prayer partner. I mean, Emily, when we had the mystery school that, you know, Ernestine and Marcia and uh, lots of people have come here for, Emily was, was also part of a lot of the interviews uh, over a period of almost, was it a year? A year of interviews, talking with people on the phone, praying with people, listening to people, what are your concerns, what are your fears, getting into logistics with people, down to the details about, well, I still have this has to be handled and I'd love to come for a month to do this immersion, but I have, there's practicalities. So that's been pretty much the same with the center. We've had some devotional stays, people coming from South Africa, people coming from America, people coming from Japan already to, to Mallorca, and there's the same loving care and prayer and joining put into every single encounter, whether it's through email, whether it's through a, f a phone call, a Skype call. It's like learning. All, all of us are learning to do is to pray together, to, to join. To, if you have fears, doubts, expose those. Don't keep them to yourself and feel like you're run by these fears and doubts and concerns, expose them. And, and that's what Emily does too. She listens and she prays and people are so grateful, I think, to have you join with them on even the practicalities, because for many people there are a number of steps. Also, uh, for what you're doing, and, and it's, like you say, it's all for your own lesson, but but you really do learn patience. Some people say, I'll call you back. They don't. I'll, I'll answer you, they don't. I mean, in Spain it's been like Emily leaves a message, leaves a message, leaves a message, a week goes by, two weeks go by, leaves a message, leaves a message, a month goes by. <laughs> you know, literally, she has to teach what she would learn and just convey what the Spirit gives her to give and not have any expectation for the outcome. Imagine yourself being in such a role where you've communicated four, five, six messages and you get one line response back. Oh, I'll let you know. <laughs> She's like, what did they say? They said they would let me know. Okay, that you see the patience, you see the persistence it takes, and it's all for mind training, it's all for listen and follow. It's not about an outcome in the world. Or people that say that they're coming and can't come for whatever circumstance. Or people that say, I'm very resistant to coming, no, I'm not coming, no, I changed my mind, I'm coming. <laughs> and Emily's like, okay. now." Okay, then you are coming. Yes, I am coming. Okay, now let's pray on what's your flight. And, you know, you see, it takes so much patience. Any of you who have been parents, you know that it's that way with children. That you say something, and then it flies over, say something again, flies over. Then when you least expect it, you told me. <laughs> yeah, yups. But you see, this is what... The process is, we're here to pray together for one reason, for listen and follow, to tune in to that prayer. And that's amazing that you have been able to do that, but it's also, it's, it expands your, your awareness so much. Yeah, it's so amazing because I feel at peace when I've done my part. So it's really pulling back from the outcome. Like sometimes it seems that whatever communication I make or it goes in the direction that I think it's going in, and that's great. 
or many times it's I communicate and it doesn't, but there, some kind of clarity comes in, like the direction's being shown. Okay, it's not that direction. It's this direction now. But my mind can rest when I've followed the prompts and when I don't hold back and doubt them, when I just go in that direction. And that's been really amazing for me. Like I, over and over again, needing to let go of what the outcome is, how the form looks. But as long as I feel like I'm following the spirit, I don't have any other responsibility and and I feel like with this retreat it's just like another mind expansion like you know like you know a, a whole week while we're here it's like a speed up speed up and yeah you can literally just feel the expansion like we always talk about in the community like take on your area like fully take it on and more and more I'm seeing what that means it's like take on listening to the spirit take on your daily bread what has been given to you by the spirit and the more I take it on the more I feel my mind expanding and the more there's no room for anything else there's no room for Emily and when there's no room for Emily I'm happy because it's only Emily that could be unhappy so it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing mind training in the sense that it's almost like if you use the, the analogy of like an orchestra where, where most people specialize in, they, they play the, the trombone or the trumpet or the, the violin or anything. Emily's like, since I've known her in these, these years, she's like, she's, she's gone down into the orchestra pit She's learned the instruments, so she's drumming down there, and she's playing the horn, and she's got the trombone and the saxophone going, and violin, and all this and this. And then Jesus is like, good, good, very good. Now move on to this one. Very good. Try this. Try the drum set. Uh, so it's, she's had to be so willing to, to play all these instruments. And then Jesus is like, okay, now climb out of the orchestra pit, and now you're going to conduct the orchestra. That's what it's like at this center in Majorca. She's like a conductor. Pipes breaking left and right. Water shooting out of pipes at an, at an old house. Electrical circuits breaking. Things are dripping. Things are leaking. This is broke. What's, what's, what do we got today? Well, this broke and that broke and that broke. Okay, I've got so-and-so flying in the airport and so-and-so flying in the airport. There's airport runs. There's things breaking down. Uh, well, we're trying to get some help over here, but they're not responding for a month. <laughs> uh, now that's actually two months now. They have not responded. Uh, it, so then you go back to prayer. You know, what is it that you would show me? What is it that needs to happen? So she's kind of gone and played the instruments so she understands about the instruments. And then also, then getting into the conducting, you have to go back to the point where everything you think and say and do has to be a blessing for everything and everyone concerned. This is what I mean by letting Jesus prioritize and direct your day. You have to have central casting I call it J.C. Central. What am I going to do now? J.C. Central. J.C. Central. Jesus Christ Central. Jesus Christ is the command module. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, they know exactly what is most important in any moment of the day. And for a human being, such a task would be impossible. It would be like being air traffic control in... in uh, LaGuardia or JFK and you need a lot of intuitive help when you've got planes coming from all over the world and planes taken off and you don't want any of those planes to crash. You have to rely on guidance. So really this is helpful because we're just kind of giving you a glimpse into the world of the mind, the inner workings of of how important mind training is and it all starts with the decision Jesus you are in charge Holy Spirit you lead the way no matter how sticky my life seems to be where I've put my fingers and my tentacles into all kinds of things where they don't really belong <laughs> and now I'm pulling my like ET <laughs> I'm pulling back I'm saying 
phone home, <laughs> phone home. I, I want to go home like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz and Jesus is like, very good. That's a good prayer. You want to go home and now I will guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. I can help you unwind from the matrix, but I, you have to follow my instructions. And it's so beautiful because you're just such a great example of that. Just, it seems like it's just remembering, again like I was saying, I did not create myself, I am not responsible for the form. It's almost like we have to remind ourselves comp all the time I'm not responsible for the form. Even with this uh, gathering here at the castle, it, I know it's been these weeks and months actually, it's been a lot of, of stepping back and trusting and praying because there seems to be so many details involved with having a group this size. So Emily's not only been had a lot of prayer going on with the center down in Mallorca, but also her attention's been letting Jesus guide and direct uh, with a lot of things with this as well. So that that's kind of a glimpse of what you feel like. You're really, it's really full on, but it's like she's asking for it. She's saying, I want this because I need this to to go through the healing. Yeah, I had a thought a few days into the retreat. It just everything felt so full and I could feel the expansion. And I said to Jesus, <laughs> don't let this stop. Please keep giving me more, like, more of these opportunities. Use me more, more, more. So. Thank you. I'm so Thank grateful you. for you, David. Oh, Thank I'm you. so grateful. You have answered the call. That's, that's what I was talking about the other day, is the saying yes, because that takes a lot to really say yes with that depth. And then to be able to keep saying yes in the face of what seems to be difficulties, resistance, emotions and and you know actually too those we we've talked a bit but those i mentioned today those uh, chapters 15 to 24 on special relationships jesus basically says in there that you know you've come so far and he says you're almost back to heaven and you just have one more hurdle to overcome to make it back to heaven, to remember heaven, and that's special relationship. And he's talking basically about the ego, specialness, because basically specialness can be aimed in any direction. You can have it with a, with a pet, with a person, with a phone. Some people would say, oh, that's my major, <laughs> I'm doing good with my husband and everybody else, but oh my gosh, if, some, if they took my phone away, <laughs> I would be lost. But but what we're really doing is we're saying that the, the specialness is what blocks us from knowing God. And deep down in our hearts we're saying, God, I would rather come to know you than to try to cling and hold on to and protect this belief in specialness. Because that's the ego. Think of it this way. You have two alternatives here. One is that God in heaven is the author of reality and God is the creator. And you can only know yourself as God created you. So the only way that's going to happen is to know yourself as Christ. And then there's this ego that made a self, just like it's nothing, it made a self of nothing. It's temporary. It made a temporary world, and basically the body is an invention of the ego, and it's very much like its maker. The maker's temporary, the body's temporary. The maker will pass away, <laughs> the body will pass away. It's like the ego looks upon the body as its offspring, and it wants to protect the body, and it wants to make the body special and unique, and it wants to make the body a representative of its separation from heaven. So those are the alternatives. Either you be the Christ with a heavenly creator, an eternal creator, or you be this temporary contradiction 
that has you're giving reality to the ego to the extent that you give belief and reality to the body you are in your mind giving a reality to the ego to the denial of God that's how deep this goes and that's why the mystics and saints have gone into the plumb the depths of the mind to find their true love the beloved to find God or oneness so thank you for everything you've done and all that you're doing and and I think we might have Emily doing a, a session here uh, one of these afternoons because I'm sure you have lots of questions <laughs> for Emily considering she's like a prayer partner of such depth of wanting to join in going very very deeply into this awakening and uh, yeah you, she would be happy to just be transparent and share with you yeah more in depth about what we've just been talking about so thank you thank you so much David thank, thank you. you and I think we're just going to finish off the session with uh, another beautiful song from Netta we can just sink in to that and then move on into lunch